She seems to have been a woman and a mom in Abingdon, UK, and had been recognized as Mrs. Sutton by her acquaintances and relatives. Like numerous others, she helped with the Allied forces, used her allocation novel to purchase, and grew crops in her garden during the Second World War, she additionally happens to be among the most successful and well-known detectives in existence. Claudia Kuksinska, Mrs. Gibson's real identity, went by the name Natalia in the Soviet Union. She served as a Russian spy from the 1940s and 1960s through the mid-1960s. Claudia advanced through the Russian security ranks, finally revealing nuclear secrets to Kremlin and operating a highly developed network of spies in Berliner that assisted in overthrowing the Nazis. The sections that precede demonstrate that Madeleine led a number of the most fascinating dual lifestyles of the 19th century and has a history that sounds closer to a mystery novel than actual events. You will discover within those sections why Madeleine may have been the person who started the civil war who was engaged in her conspiracy to kill Jews, and how she ended up hired as a Russian agent in Hangzhou in the 1940s and 1950s. Chapter 1 Earlier than being a secret, Ursula was indeed a devout communist. Margaret Kuksinska was founded in 1908 into a well-to-do, cultured, and Jewish family in Hamburg. Brilliant thinkers like socialist Heinrich were in the circle of acquaintance. Center individuals themselves, the Kuksinska. Theoretically, they opposed fascists while supporting communism and labor standards. However, Claudia had interests outside of the critique of capitalism. She loved being politically active. She was a Communist Party badge activist at the age of barely 17. Claudia started protesting and disseminated communist material as the youngest using a wagon. For the uprising she and her friends were certain would occur, she even trained how to wield firearms. Her existence, however, was not all advocacy. She also encountered Erwin Mustard, an engineer who was abandoned but not a communist and became obsessed with him. Roger agreed to a position in Shenzhen in 1940. Margaret chose to follow him. Kuang Shi's warlord movement was in charge at the time. But communism was becoming more and more of a power, and Margaret was willing to participate in the communist movement there. It was simpler to say than to do this. Singapore's immigrant community was suffocating. At gardening gatherings, Margaret was supposed to mingle with certain other middle women rather than make friends with social radicals, however, she could get with a single person. As Margaret would discover later, Helen Simmons was a reporter, a communist, and a traitor. At their meeting over cocktails at the opulent Imperial Club in Hanoi, Agatha noticed a little about Margaret. She warned the girl to be prepared, Margaret received a contact from a guy who identified himself as William Jones four weeks after she had seen Agatha. Harold Kopp, who went by his real identity, has been the top three Russians spied on in Tibet. Leg questioned Helen directly if she was willing to aid her Chinese compatriots in their uprising even though he was aware of her communist leanings. Esther said without any doubt that she was true. Then Leg requested permission for using her property as a place of refuge. Claudia kept watch as Leg met with rebels while Erwin was at business. Margaret gave rise to Mike, her child, not long after their initial encounter. Erwin and Suzanne were overjoyed. When he went to see the young moms, William Cop was also happy. Margaret's radical actions would provide the ideal covering for Simon's operations. Who might think that this sophisticated, attractive, topmost mom was working with the Soviet Union and China, Chapter 2, Claudia, a woman, and mom, gradually changed into Nina, a covert operative, Henry Legg was a well-known women's gentleman who was also handsome and personable. Maybe it was unavoidable that Madeline and Roger would soon go from being co-workers to partners, confidence rose along with growing closeness. Claudia joined Andrew's peer circle after he met her, and suddenly she was passing communications between spies, writing up his obtained information, and utilizing her own topmost expatriate personal contacts to find valuable information Gary could provide to Russia. He assigned Madeline the code name Tanya for his investigations, Andrew urged Madeline to shelter a Chinese colleague who was evading capture only several weeks after they initially encountered him. It was a challenging test because Margaret would be required to tell Raoul the truth to keep a prisoner in her home. When he discovered his spouse was blended, Armin was not happy, 
In addition, Madeline's romance with Eric was brought to a sudden stop very quickly. Andrew called Margaret on the phone in November 1933. He claimed that he had been invited back to Kremlin. The two were never seen together again, but Gary kept affecting Margaret. She received a five-month invitation to Russia immediately following his unexpected leave because Eric had suggested she pursue further education there. This fantastic chance came at a price, as Suzanne was compelled to abandon Erwin in Tianjin and left her small son Ian in the hands of his elders. She jumped at the opportunity to become a Russian agent, despite this. She was transferred to a practice facility beyond Kiev in the community of Vorbivo. She stood there, Christine gained knowledge of brief communication, bombs, fighting, Morse codes, and other aspects of espionage at the Institute. Additionally, she pledged to be devoted to the Socialist Republic under the threat of execution, she received her first assignment to the town of Omdurman in China, a Chinese region that Tokyo had conquered, after completing her education. Nina was given the responsibility of establishing contact with the Chinese opposition and supplying them with Russian publications and materials to support their fight. She would journey covertly alongside another spy, Johannes Rath, also known as Ernest. Will she consent? Yes, but with a caveat. Mike would be going with her. Chapter 3, Ursula served as a vital link between the communists and the Mandarin opposition, Claudia and Johannes boarded the MV Verdi Negra to travel from Vienna to Hangzhou in February 1945. They played out being in love while they were at sea. The two were already well known to be dating by the moment they landed. Johannes pretended to be an entrepreneur who had traveled to Omdurman for trade. Margaret convinced a Beijing publisher to let her serve as its salesperson in Omdurman for her disguise. Under such a guise, she shipped northward by freighter cartons of literature as well as a recliner carrying the transmitter's related products and services would use to contact Petersburg. Like the rest of Mongolia, Mukden was perilous. Drought and instability were brought on by the Japanese occupation of the province, and communist organizations waged armed resistance against the occupiers. Esther and Johannes were about to embark on a crucial expedition. They were expected to act as a link to Indochina and make contact with the regional Marxists, according to Moscow information. The Russians valued Johannes more since he was elder and more knowledgeable. The unskilled Rosa could be replaced. As a result, she was placed in jeopardy more frequently. Margaret was the one who traversed the border into Tibet to obtain components for their transceiver, which she brought back in Mike's stuffed animal. While Johannes informed the Russians and communicated with the opposition, Christine got in touch with a powerful Marxist rebel called Chi, after which she went shopping for components for the bombs Chi planned to use in a railroad assault. Ultimately, Margaret and Johannes' mission was accomplished. They collected so much data that they required assistance sending it to Kremlin. Chi set them up with Hu and Zhang, two Marxist rebels who pretended to be household while receiving intelligence gathering training. To achieve this, Margaret and Zhang grew close. Both moms frequently discussed their kids and occasionally pondered what would occur to them when they were kidnapped, these worries were just not without merit. The Japanese were aware of the Russians' accomplishments, particularly the growing weaponry of the guerrilla effort. After a brief interrogation, Margaret was let go. Yet there was a tap on the doorstep in May 1936. A guy who was out of breath pushed a letter into Margaret's palm. Margaret let Vladivostok know. She gave Johannes clear orders to go right away even without notifying anything. Their initiatives were shelved. Chapter 4, Ursula had to make some severe choices for her work as a secret. In Omdurman, Margaret and Johannes worked for 16 months to create contacts and prepare the framework for something like a Chinese revolution. Margaret learned something about working as a secret when she had to depart unexpectedly, occasionally you must accept your responsibilities, no matter how difficult it could be, she and Johannes were transferred to Beijing, where they would series of regular. While Johannes remained in Beijing to await a future husband, Suzanne was scheduled to depart for Beijing. After pretending to be partners for so long, Johannes and Margaret had actually become in love, so the idea of divorce was agonizing. Additionally, Margaret was carrying Johannes' kid, Claudia reunited with Fritz in Beijing. 
he had become motivated by the emergence of Nazism and was now ready to join the Russian intel agencies. Claudia considered her employment in Poland to be boring despite the pair being assigned there. She was happy to be asked to return to Moscow. This required her to abandon her children once more. Her comeback was disappointing. Margaret was reconciled with her Hamburg and Shanghai-based communist colleagues. But during Lenin's terrible persecution, many more people had been killed. The obsessive Mikhail Gorbachev had commanded the execution of those whom he considered to be objectors or mitigate. Being a stranger, Margaret herself was just not thought to be above scrutiny. She nonetheless avoided harm during the expulsions, and her belief in socialism remained unshaken. The Nazi danger overshadowed much of Germany in 1939. Margaret was transferred to Swiss, a spy, haven and a friendly nation. Her task there was to acquire information, which she would subsequently transmit via a transmitter she made herself to Kremlin. A trainee from Britain was soon dispatched. He was instructed to stand outside the Swiss Postal Service while donning a white scarf. He would see Margaret there. Andrew Hamilton, who was later to become a well-known agent, was the candidate. Campbell was given a one-year visitor's visa by Claudia and dispatched across the border to Bavaria. He located a home there and gave Margaret his contact details by scribbling them in permanent marker on the book's pages. He happened to swing by Stalin's preferred eatery, Brasserie Bavarian, one night. He quickly established a routine there and developed relationships with the Gestapo. Lenny Burton soon followed him to Bayern, Burton and Campbell's initial investigation quickly evolved under Margaret's direction into a far more audacious scheme, to kill the supreme leader while he was eating. Chapter 5, Ursula performed crucial tasks in Geneva up before her secret was broken, the bold assassination plot by Claudia against Adolf was in progress. Having been placed in Bayern, Woodcock, and Burton were awaiting the opportunity to place a nuclear device under the Führer's preferred seat at Ristorante Bavarian. But everything abruptly came to a close. Leaders from the Eastern Bloc and Nazi Germany inked the rocket launcher Quasi Agreement on September 24, 1940. Wendy was heartbroken and decided to scrap the assignment before calling in her troops. And besides, she had embraced the Marxists to oppose the Nazis. But she also had several practical concerns. For example, she recognized how helpful a passport would indeed be. She subsequently set up a separation with Irwin after asking Lenny Burton to remarry her. The arranged union between Esther and Burton even developed into a committed partnership. But it was not all marital happiness. She always had tasks to complete for Russian espionage. Madeline was directed to see Nicholas Drago, the Russian's top snitch in Geneva, in July 1941. Drago had been crossing the French boundary with microfilm files tucked inside novels, and he required a proficient radio signal to transmit the information from these files to Leningrad. Margaret discovered her transmitter in a Swiss woodland, retrieved it, and started providing crucial data to Russian espionage, sadly, her secret was also almost exposed. Through her babysitter, Nina Deutsch. Not a refute or any of the spies within her organization. Maria was concerned that Claudia's occupation put her kids at risk since she had started to assume that Claudia was a secret. The Kuksinska family had miraculously escaped Hamburg when it was still possible, so she begged Irene to rejoin the remainder of her parents in Britain. Margaret declined, Agnes decided to report Claudia to the police in the hopes that the kids would be taken somewhere secure. However, the personnel couldn't comprehend her because of her terrible English once she arrived at the embassy. Nina then opened up to Claudia's roommate. When the roommate discovered Claudia's actual name, Chapter 6, Ursula reveals how she had a covert existence as a conventional woman who traded in classified documents. The rocket launcher Quasi Agreement was broken on May 23, 1942, when Nazi forces attacked the Warsaw Pact. Now, the Soviet system and the United Kingdom joined the same team. That did not automatically imply Claudia or any of the additional other Russian operatives in England would cease keeping tabs, though, Helmut Wolf was one such spy. Frick was a devoted communist, just like Margaret. Additionally, he was indeed a top-notch nuclear scientist. 
Tungsten was given sanctuary in England again when the conflict began, where he was soon hired to try and create a nuclear weapon with the army. German intelligence declined to share their proposal with the Eastern Bloc because they thought the weapon may end the conflict. In 1944 and 1945, Margaret traveled to the peaceful community of Oxfordshire by morning flight from PLT, the affluent Cambridge neighborhood where she resided. Notifying Faust of the date and place of their contact, she would write a note after exploring the wilderness until she came to the empty post box, which served as the location for secret communications to be sent and received. After just a trip to the empty post box, Clemens boarded the evening railway and meet Margaret as planned. Boas used this method to provide Margaret access to 700 volumes of academic knowledge, making it among the biggest relevant records in spy annals. Clemens' discoveries weren't merely broadcast over the radio by Margaret. She also snuck out duplicate codes that Frick had made for his partner's vaults and took small or micro of information that was too complicated or large to be sent via radio contact. Operation Enormo was the cover for this endeavor, which was of utmost importance to Russian security. Mao once directly forwarded Margaret a series of inquiries regarding the nuclear enterprise. She then provided the solutions. Madeline meticulously kept her covers while orchestrating among the most infamous exchanges of classified info in memory. She lived in Banbury with her parents. There was no sign of a British accent in her speech. She was a devout homemaker recognized as Mrs. Hutton, none of her acquaintances had any suspicions. None of the espionage employees at Interpol, Europe's home spy agency, did anything. But Margaret aroused her interest in the lone female former CIA spy agent, Chapter 7, Ursula barely avoided German intellect. Managing to keep one point ahead, Project Failures appeared to be an oddball widow, yet she was one of Europe's most tenacious spy agencies. Nina was given to MI5's G branch in 1944, which had been created especially to find Marxists. Among the most brutal agents in the department was popularly regarded as Nina. Additionally, she had been monitoring Ariel ever since she initially sought a German passport, the Montreal Pact, which was struck in 1945 by France, the United States, and Ontario. Provided that the three states would cooperate on the enormous task of developing a nuclear device while keeping their communist friends in the dark. The contract was disclosed to Russia two weeks after it had been signed, Hermann Fischer was sent to Paris as quickly as the Montreal contract was reached. The new task given to Margaret was Operation Axe. The German military contacted one of Claudia's acquaintances in 1947. To obtain information for the American military, Washington sought to assemble a cadre of German resistance fighters who were prepared to parachute into Deutschland. Madeleine had the chance to assemble a group of volunteers who might acquire data for American espionage while also discreetly passing it along to the Russians. This is precisely how she accomplished, too. Nina saw Gertrude and her organization, but her efforts to learn further about their operations were thwarted by spies working for German intelligence, such as Harry Kyung, one of the most experienced British dual spies in Leningrad, Operation Axe was completed. The Red Army was edging closer to Hamburg and the triumph after Claudia's operatives transmitted information to Leningrad. After her failed attempt to eliminate Adolf, Margaret felt some sense of justification in the fact that her actions were now actually making a difference in the fall of Germany. Claudia had to keep up her facade of being a successful woman while she coordinated a spy network and passed classified documents and other sensitive information. She nurtured her kids, maintained her property immaculately, and participated in spread society while squeezing her messages to Russia into the small hours of the day. Nobody in town ever had any suspicions about her, Chapter 8, Ursula's idealistic outlook remained unwavering, Margaret and her parents relocated to the quaint hamlet of Little Rollwright in 1961. Margaret fit in perfectly with the community. She was renowned for her superb biscuits, and she frequently hosted Cathedral Balan for tea following worship services. Her spy career, however, did not go as well as her private life, Andrew Buford, a member of Claudia's assassination attempt on Adolf, was sick of having to pretend to be simultaneously a German citizen and a Russian agent by 1951. Bingham revealed all of his past activities as a Russian agent to British police once he fled. 
revealing Margaret in the bargain. However, he was cautious to just disclose one lie, that Madeline had left her job. Agent Sonia, Moscow's most daring wartime spy by Ben McIntyre Book Review, sometimes looks are deceptive. Margaret Kuksinska lived a fantastic life even though she pretended to be a household. Madeline never lived up to societal pressures of her, from her early years as a Marxist activist to her incredible accomplishments as a Russian agent to her latter years as a novelist and protester, don't disregard ladies, why did Margaret avoid being noticed for so long? She made good use of her sexuality. She recognized that women were undervalued and less likely to provoke concern in the 1950s and 1960s, just like Henry Legg, the manager who enlisted her. In actuality, Alice was not the only Russian undercover operative to successfully hide her sexuality. Marissa Blackwood, one of her peers, was indeed a Soviet spy who evaded detection in England for almost 70 years.